In this tutorial, we're going to look at how to write an introduction, which will be the first chapter of your project. Now, I've already covered this in previous uh, tutorials that there is a, a structure to how you write your project, um, and you uh, are looking to target four marks according to the mark schemes that allow you to justify the choice of, as it says here, a complex geographical topic of research. What that really means is you need to justify why you have chosen the um, particular project that you have chosen. And I'm going to show you in today's tutorial how to do that. I will use a model um, introduction and walk you through the model to show you the key components of a good introduction and the type of style you might choose. You'll also find that there are three other sample introductions available for you to look at and which will give you an idea on how students have written introductions. Um, and every student has their own voice and their own writing style, so no two introductions look exactly the same. Now, you may not be targeting the huge or largest amount of marks here. You are, at the end of the day, only looking at four of the 60. However, it is the first thing that the marker is going to read. And if you set up your introduction very well and you're very clear in your own mind what your project is doing and why you're doing this project, well, then actually all of the rest of your project becomes a lot easier um, to deliver. So let's just have a little look at the kind of the breakdown of what the mark, uh, the SQA markers uh, say you should have in a good introduction. And then I'll show, I'll transfer that into language you might understand better. So it, your introduction should clearly outline the aim of your investigation. So somewhere in there, probably at the beginning, it should be, you should be very clear about what you are aiming to achieve. Now, clearly, most of the marks actually come from this second bullet point here. Why are you conducting this research? What is the purpose of it? Why is it important? And I'll give you some examples uh, on how to do that. OK, um, it is important that you are very clear about how you intend to go about uh, conducting this project. So where are you going to go and what information data are you going to gather um, to complete this particular research? in? in this case, to achieve your aim. Link to the purpose is possibly why is it relevant. So depending on what you have chosen, um, it might be that it's highly relevant what you're researching. As a matter of fact, it's very easy to turn almost any area of geography into a highly relevant thing to research. Even if it might seem to you to be quite a small part of the world in which you live, um, there's always a way of looking at it as a smaller part of a much bigger whole. Um, and it's you're going to want to stress the relevance. And I'll show you um how to in the example i've got uh how to really highlight the relevance and what's really important is this word explicit now you're going to come across this quite a lot in your research doing something explicitly means where you are really upfront and directly quoting the mark schemes back to the marker um, and telling them this is why you're studying it and being very clear about the research that you've read that's led you to that and i'll show you what being explicit actually looks like when you're when you're doing a piece of writing. And in this case, you've got to be explicit to geographical literature research that you've read. So without that, you're going to find in a number of places in this project, you're going to drop a lot of marks if you haven't done any uh, research or used any prior geographical literature. OK, so this is the actual straight from the mark scheme. And you can see that the mark scheme is divided into three sections, three levels. Um, if you have a zero marks, then you haven't provided any evidence about why you have chosen this particular piece of research. Um, if you're going to look to get one or two marks, I have uh, you give me a purpose for why uh, you are studying this particular piece of work. And it's not just because you like it or you're interested in it. Uh, it's got to go beyond your own purpose. Um, and you've also indicated the relevance uh, of your your research. If you want to target the top marks, the top level, three or four marks, you don't just need the purpose, uh, which also appears down in the one, two, but uh, you're also looking to combine that with the relevance. So you're looking to do both of these two parts. OK, and you can see here you must be explicit in your reference. So unless you are explicit, along with outlining the purpose and relevance, well, you're not going to be able to get into this top level. Right, so that's uh, the actual um, introduction, sort of what the mark is showing. Let's have a look at actually a, um, 
a model answer uh, on how to do this, which is going to give you a strong idea about how to approach it. Now, you're going to want to take some notes um, as I go through this tutorial, um, because you're going to want to refer back to these when you start writing your own introduction. And uh, the first thing to bear in mind is that uh, you're going to want to put the title at some point at the beginning. Now, it's likely the title itself um, is going to uh, appear um, on, on the front page of your project. So it might not actually be at this point, uh, just above the introduction. OK, um, an investigation into the aim, the impact of a river event on the discharge of river and the extent to which surrounding urban land uses accelerate the rate of change of the river's discharge during a rain event. OK, now at this stage, that is a title. That's what the investigation is about. It's a very long title. And don't be worried if your title that you've developed is very long. A title should be very detailed and outline exactly what something's about. Um, before you then write your introduction, it's very well worthwhile actually turning that title into an aim. OK, so what are we really investigating? Here? What do we want to see? So our aim is to discover the extent to which um, developments in the surrounding landscape of the river influence the discharge of the river when it rains and how and whether this is changing over time. OK, now let's have a little think about the aim that you will formulate. So what, what is the formulation of a good aim? OK, a good aim should have something like the ex to discover the extent or how much or it, it, it's, a, it's a wording or a phrasing um, about uh, the outcome of this. And, and what's clear here is in this particular example that the outcome is that you want to find out how much the building uh, building on a river's drainage basin, on the, on the landscape that is around a river, causes that river to change. Does the river change in its behavior when it rains or does it not? Now, clearly, obviously, this is something you will have remember from higher geography. And it's a useful, if you have picked a project somehow linked to some knowledge that you developed in higher geography. But um, urbanizing areas around rivers clearly has an influence on the river's behavior. And you're wanting to see how much. So when it rains, does the river discharge change quite dramatically in the areas where it's been urbanized? There's a second part to this aim, though, in this last little sentence. And this will come out more obvious later on when we look at some research questions linked to this kind of project. And that is uh, that, you know, is this changing over time? So is it getting worse? Is river flooding getting worse? Are people building more around rivers? That's the kind of idea. So you've got a name. So by the end of the project, you should be able to answer that. You should know to what extent the building around the river has influenced. Has it done it a lot or very little? And you should be able to quantify that maybe with a number or a statistic or, or some kind of general statement based on evidence you've gathered that tells me whether or not the surrounding landscape is influencing the river's discharge when it rains. And I should also, by the end of it, by the conclusion, have an idea about whether in this particular river that you would be investigating, this was something that had been changed in recent years. Maybe it's got worse, for example. OK, so have a think about your title. You should have already uh, to got to this point of writing introduction. You should have have a quite a fleshed out title. Uh, and if you don't feel you've got one, then speak to your teacher. You should then evolve that into the actual aim, which says what you're trying to achieve. And if you read the two, both the title and the aim, you will see that they are somewhat different. I'm just going to change that slightly there. OK. Um, let's actually now have a look at an introduction, OK, because you haven't actually achieved any marks at this stage and you're looking to target four marks. And there are a variety of ways to write an introduction. Clearly, you want to write introduction. You want to show clear structure and organization of your work. So the use of headings and subheadings is um, strongly recommended in an advanced higher piece of work. Now, I've chosen to start with a quote. 
um, which I have found on a website. OK, and the reason I am starting off with a quote is this gets me straight into um, the relevance and the justification for conducting this research. OK, um, if I'm going to study a river and look at how rain influences that river and whether human beings are changing how rivers behave, then clearly what I'm really talking about is I'm talking about flooding. And flooding is a negative thing for human beings. It has an impact on them. It can destroy homes. It can take lives. So it's an important factor. And um, if, if human beings are building around rivers, then they are clearly going to increase flood risks and that could be a, a negative impact. So if I'm trying to justify it, finding a quote is a really good rhetorical style um, in English. It's, it's a nice way to begin something um, because right, right away I'm thinking about flooding and human activity and rivers just from that one quote. Bear in mind, all I've read is the introduction, uh, sorry, the um, title and the aim. So I've, I've got an idea that this is a study about rivers and rainfall and whether rivers flood or not. I've now got this this quote um, and I'm, I'm now starting to think about it. So think about your own project title, think about your aim, and then think about what is it that you're really, you know, what, what makes your study important? And then do some research and see if you can lift a piece of text from somebody else's research, somebody uh, possibly somebody famous, but it doesn't have to be, some academic who's written something on it, and start off with it as a quote. Now, you'll see that the next thing is I've got this little number one. Now, that's going to become quite important um, later on. But I got this from a website. So the first thing I do is because it's the first time I've included a piece of work from somebody else, I have included who that person is down at the bottom in what's called the footer. So when you go to a page in Google and you click on the bottom, very at the very bottom of the screen, it will open up the footer. You can see there it is. And I've typed number one, and I've uh, this came from an article called Managing Flood Risk. So I've typed the name of that article. I've included the web link, and then I've put 2021 because that I went, I scrolled to the article and found that it had been written in 2021. OK, so I've included on, on the same page where I make that quote down at the bottom, I can find where that comes from. Now, this is where you are start to be explicit about the fact that you have read work and research. OK, now there's one final step you want to do with this. You want to then copy that and paste it into a document called bibliography. So if you go into the Google Classroom, you'll find that there is a, a document in one of the steps called bibliography. Uh, and you should, in order of, as they appear, so start with number one, you should paste every time you cite somebody, and citing is where you quote somebody or refer to somebody else's work, and you do that just with this little number in a bracket. Um, every time you do that, you should sequence it both in the footer on the page in which it appears, but also then put the full one or the full developed uh, one in the uh, bibliography, which might also include the name of the author. So if you can find the name of the person who wrote this, you can put the name of the author in the bibliography at the end, um, as well as the name of the article, the web link, and 2021. Now, you want to do that as you find more and more sources. As you go through this more and more, then you want to include more and more of these. Now, this is going to be a very important little uh, habit to get into. Some pages may not have anything in a footer because you may not have quoted anybody or referred to anybody's research at all. You'll find on this first introduction page, I've actually quoted or referred to four or cited four people's work, which is why the footer's got one, two, three, and four. And every single time it's got the title, if there is indeed a title. If there's no title, just put the web address. If you can't find a date in which it was published, put the date that you viewed it. So for example, if this wasn't published in 2016, but I could find, I looked, uh, sorry, if I looked at it in 2022, I would just say viewed 2022, if I'm unable to find the date. Lots of web sources don't actually have dates on them, which is why you have to put when you view them. OK, let's go back and have a look at what we're doing. So you've decided to opt for finding a quote um, to kind of give a real high impact start. Now, you don't have to do that. What you can do is what I've done in this first paragraph. OK, so you clearly need to tell the reader what is my project about and you're kind of once again, you're almost repeating what the, uh, the aim and the title is. So this investigation is going to examine the extent, or that's how much a rainfall, a single rainfall event influences the discharge of a river. 
Okay, so your first sentence should say my projects or this investigation is going to do what it tell me what it's going to do. Um, you then want to be a little bit more focused. You want to say, okay, what, so what am I going to focus on? Well, I'm going to focus on different areas along the course of a river and decide, uh, determine whether it, the discharge increases more in areas where the surrounding drainage basin has been noticeably altered by human activity. So um, that's me telling, the first sentence here was very general. The second sentence started to drill into that to kind of give the reader an idea about exactly what you, the writer, is actually planning on doing. Okay, then we get straight into why is this an important investigation? And I've come up with two reasons why studying rivers, especially how building around them influences them. And the first one, so the importance of this investigation is twofold. Firstly, as outlined in the quote above, whilst flooding is a natural phenomenon, it is worsened when humans alter the surrounding landscape. Now, if we think back to uh, the particular purpose and relevance, okay, to get the three or four marks. So what do I need to write for the purpose and relevance? Well, I'm saying that the relevance, if we think about why is it relevant to study rivers? Well, this quote here tells me why it's relevant, because rivers can be altered by humans, which then makes flooding worse. Okay, so I've got a very clear statement and I've cited it. So I'm linking to the background research. I've now gone a little bit further. I've found some research by this person here, C.P. Conrad, number two. So that citation should link then to the footnote. And we can see that effects of flood development on urban development floods with a web link and then the year. And if I then put that into the bibliography, I would actually also then write uh, up here, I'd write C.P. Conrad effects of urban development of floods. So in the biblio, I don't need the full um, thing on the citation in the footnote, but in the bibliography, I should find the full um, address and title of that article. So research by C.P. Conrad number two noted that natural factors like, and now I've quoted something that he said, which is also really quite good. One or two quotes of, from some research that you found. Once again, that's you being explicit. That's you showing I've read this person's work and I've linked it to my study. So this C.P. Conrad is saying that how long a storm lasts and the landscape, that's the topography and the, the rock, the geology, are all, all play a role in how discharge changes. So these are natural factors. However, he notes that changes to the surrounding storage capacity of the landscape, especially when forestry is removed and artificial surfaces are built, plays a larger role. So I'm showing I've understood C.P. Conrad's work and that C.P. Conrad said that when we build around rivers, um, they play it, it's going to play a large role in as I've said here, how the discharge changes, which is at the end of the day, what my project is about. So I've now got some explicit, uh, if I go back here, I've got some explicit reference to geographical literature. I've actually got three pieces of ge relevant geographical literature already explicitly referred to. I know why it, the purpose of the project, it's very clear, it's rivers flood and they can affect us. And I've got a quote to back that up. And I know why it's relevant um because we're building around rivers now i'm going to strengthen up that idea of why it's relevant further down okay however before i get there i found a piece of work in his article which shows two rivers and i've written about it here however he notes that ch changes uh, sorry these changes are highlighted in two storm guard graphs in figure one and now this here is figure one okay and actually uh, what i would want to do is have figure one written down here so the reader um the person that's marking your work can see that this graph is called figure one so that's just a little omission i've made but if you're going to you're going to want to get into the habit of saying every time you refer to a graph or a photo you're going to want to say in your text in figure one in figure two in figure three and then whatever the the, te the, the graphic is whether it's a graph or a photo or a map you want to want to title them figure one figure two figure three so in figure one Conrad's research shows how the discharge of two contrasting rivers changed during the same rain event. We can see that. Um, the river that was surrounded by a very urbanized landscape, the Mercer Creek, that's the green line here, had a much more rapid rising limb and a higher peak discharge. And we can see it's much higher than this other river. His research revealed that flood peak discharge can increase by 600% when the surrounding basin is developed. Right, so what am I showing? Once again, I'm showing very clearly the purpose of this study, that when we um, build, develop in a basin, in a river basin, 
it's six it's potential 600 percent more likely to flood or the peak is going to be 600 percent higher it's actually what he his research shows now when if you can get a little statistic like this um, that's really powerful some kind of factual number and that really strengthens about why it's important. So if I'm studying rivers and it, building around them, how it's going to make them worse, and I have found that somebody's research shows that they're like the peak discharge is going to be 600% higher if we in areas where we're built around the river. Well, that makes it very relevant to conduct this study. Now, the ultimate relevance is if you can always think about climate change. That's probably the most, the biggest impact on our planet. And if your project is somehow influenced or could influence climate change, then that's a very powerful rationale. Does it, that doesn't have to be um, climate change. It could be anything where human beings or nature is impacted or impacting humans. Um, you, that's a very powerful reason to conduct research. And once again, I've, in my language, I've actually said the second rationale. Now, rationale is just a fancy reason of saying the second reason. OK, so the second reason for this study is linked to the effects of climate change on river discharge. Now, at this stage, if you're going to make a big, bold statement about my project's really important because it's it's, you know, it's part of the climate change issue, then make sure it really is. Or if it's to do with deforestation or the death of wildlife or businesses being negatively impacted, whatever your study is on and you're somehow making some bold statements, make sure you're very clear on what that negative or that harm is. So I found some research, research by the London School of Economics. There's a little citation mark there, so I can scroll down to the bottom and see number three. Um, it's there. there. There's the title. There's the web link. There's the year. If I went in the bibliography, I should see the same thing, but I should also see that the author is the LSE or the London School of Economics. That, sh that would be the full title in the bibliography. Um, Research by London School of Economics has shown that climate change is resulting in longer periods of dry hot weather, as well as an increase in the frequency and intensity of rain events. So what's the London School of Economics really saying? That climate change is making the ground really dry and uh, because of hot weather, but it's also making those sudden rain events uh, happening more often. And when they do happen, there's an awful lot of rain coming out of the sky. That's what intensity of rain events means. When combined, a river system is unable to absorb the rainwater and thus floods. So what the London School of Economics is saying is because climate change is changing the landscape, drying it out, but also increasing the sudden rain events, it means that rivers aren't, can't cope with that sudden influx of water and the surrounding landscape can't absorb it. So why is that important? And this is the key sentence. It is therefore very important for communities that live near a river to understand where the new developments is or that should be are increasing the flood risk especially as climate changes so are these new developments in this case um, making the flood risk worse in a world that is warming up so if you've got something that you're studying that by no, by having the knowledge a little bit more knowledge on it we might be able to understand it people might be able to understand the world that's changing because of climate change or anything else whether it's a development on the landscape and how that how people might be harmed by it then it's worthwhile finding a bit of research that shows that, as I've done here, and then explaining, as in this sentence, why that's an issue. So between the work of the London School of Economics, this guy called Conrad, his research, as well as this quotation here, which was uh, from a local government website, I have got three citations that show I've read widely, I've read three pieces of work, I've understood them and I've linked them into my study. I've told you why my, the purpose of my study, why it's relevant in the 21st century. All I'm left to do is outline what I'm actually, how I'm going to go about gathering the data. So this investigation will gather data on the Amity Burn in Persia. So I've just very, very quickly and briefly said where the study is going to happen. It's going to compare that river to a model river, and that model river is going to be the Bradshaw model. Once again, there's a cit citation there because the Bradshaw model is a piece of theory um, from a textbook called The Earth Changing Surface by MJ Bradshaw, published in 1978. So because I'm comparing something to a model, I found that model on the web, on the internet, and I've also sourced who wrote it. So I've had to cite it down here. So I've even I've added another layer of evidence of my reading. It will then seek to examine the extent to which these characteristics change both during and after a rain event. So I've 
Finally, through interviews with local residents as well as historical research, it will look to discover the effects that prior flood events have had on the local community and whether these are changing with time. So what's this final paragraph doing? It's giving a very brief introduction into the bits of information I am going to be gathering in order to complete this study. There's no detailed methodology here. It doesn't tell me how I'm going to conduct the interviews or what the historical research is going to look like. It doesn't tell me how I'm going to gather my river data. Um, it doesn't tell me much about Bradshaw's model. All of that's going to come in the background research and the methodology. It's just a paragraph saying how I'm going to go about doing this. Right, so there is how to write a very good introduction. Hopefully you've not just been listening, that you've been pausing and taking notes along the way, thinking about the key components. So if we break this down, we've got a couple of paragraphs at the start up here, which indicate what the project's going to be about. We've then got the relevance and purpose outlined through the main body of the introduction. And that's linked to three citations. The first one being the quote at the top, the second one being Conrad, and the third one being the London School of Economics. In there are quotes. There's two direct quotations lifted, both the one at the start, but also Conrad's quote. And there's also a factual piece of information. All of these tell the reader why this is an important piece of geography to be looked at, to be conducted. And then the final part of the introduction is just this paragraph which outlines how I'm going to go about doing this study. Also, we've maintained the footnote at the bottom of the page with all the citations, so I know where these in, this information comes from. This is really important. Otherwise, the reader will not believe that you actually found this information yourself. And the final and the big question, I'm just going to type it here, how long should you aim for this to be? Well, 400 words. That's what you're aiming to not go over 400 words. OK, it's likely you'll write more the first time. When I wrote this as an example, it, I wrote 580 words. I then gradually brought it down to 400 words by just rephrasing sentences and cutting material out. OK. If we have a little look over it, we've got a clear title and aim. You've got a nice bold introduction on a large font size. What text counts towards your word limit? Now, that's really important. The text that counts towards your word, word limit is not titles, quotes, or things like figure one that you might have written down here under this diagram, nor is the words this footnote. The only words that count towards your word limits are what we call the words in the body of the text. So it's these words here. And if you want to keep track in a Google Doc how many of how many words these are, just go tools, word count, and it'll tell you that I have 380. There's actually 470 words on this page, but only 380 of them count towards my overall word limit. OK. And you want to, as you go, try to keep your word limit to the rough recommended word limits that I will give you in each chapter. Good luck.